silahkan Bu Tri. Ya, oke baik. Eh, saya sapa dulu Bapak Ibu yang ada di sini untuk memulai open lecture kita malam ini. Suara saya bisa didengar dengan baik, ya? Baik, Bu. Clear, ya. Bu. Oke. Bapak-Ibu peserta boleh open cam sehingga kita biar enak nanti diskusinya ya. Oke, saya mulai dulu. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat malam, good evening untuk semua hadirin yang ada di sini. Bapak-Ibu semua uh, di hari Jumat seperti biasa uh, program Pasca Sarjana Institut Teknologi dan Bisnis Asia Program Studi Magister Manajemen selalu menghadirkan open lecture dengan narasumber yang eh, bermacam-macam dan pastinya sangat luar biasa. Dan malam ini kita kedatangan Prof. Mark Dennis Uyako, beliau dari Filipina. Ya, eh, sebelum saya memperkenalkan lebih lanjut. Uh, sebenarnya saya uh, di sini selaku moderator agak kebingungan juga ya kebingungan saya apa ketika saya membaca CV beliau gitu ya saya hanya bisa uh, gini jadi uh, ekspresi saya benar-benar kaget gitu ya beliau yang masih ternyata masih sangat muda sekali gitu ya still young dengan pencapaian-pencapaian uh, yang luar biasa. Bisa saya ringkaskan di sini Bapak-Ibu, uh, apa namanya, CV beliau saya bacakan singkat aja, sehingga nanti bisa dilanjut sama uh, profitnya sendiri ya. Uh, begitu ya Prof, nanti later before starting your uh, discussion, I hope that you can explain about you yourself first, about uh, all the achievement that you have gitu ya. Prof. Mark Dennis Uyako ini uh, co-founder and board of director of UPNXT Holding Incorporation. Uh, itu salah satu aja. Kemudian, he is also the chief strategy officer of Solatio Properties and a former board of director of Strive Executive Asia. Beliau pernah menjabat itu. Kemudian, He is an ICD, Institute of Corporate Director Certified Technology Director. Selain di bidang ekonomi, beliau juga di bidang uh, IT ternyata. Kemudian, Prof. Dennis Uyako was in the IT industry for almost a decade as a senior project manager in Accenture Philippines and San Miguel Corporation's IT group. And... Today, his advocacy is to promote entrepreneurship from the grassroots. Therefore, being invited by many organizations and top business schools in the Philippines and abroad to provide business strategies and share entrepreneurial acumen. Wow, luar biasa. Sekilas singkat yang saya sampaikan ini menunjukkan bahwa kita saat ini beruntung banget bisa menghadirkan beliau hari ini Uh, beliau akan membawakan ya tema yang akan beliau sampaikan untuk malam ini kepada kita se sebuah uh, ilmu yang nggak kalah luar biasanya gitu ya tentang family business governance and constitution and with the topic how to run a family business professionally luar biasa oke okay, here we are with prof mark dennis uyako and for uh, two hours we will discuss with him so bapak ibu nanti uh, sembari menyimak materinya bila ada pertanyaan silahkan nanti bisa disampaikan di qna atau raise hand gitu ya nanti kalau ada Kendala dengan bahasanya, saya akan mencoba untuk uh, bersama-sama di sini. Kita juga ada Bu Rektor kita tercinta, Ibu Risa Santoso, dan juga I ada Ibu Kaprodi kita, Ibu Teresia Pradiani. Oke, okay. welcome Prof. Mark Dennis Uyako. How are you today? Alright, ah, terima kasih. Oke, okay. <laughs> yes, oke, okay. Prof. You will have two hours. 
Mm -hmm. We may start with the explanation and then uh, at the end, we will have a discussion, question and answer like this. Okay. Are you ready? All right. Um, actually, yes. uh, we can, uh, since we're having a two-hour discussion, so we we can do it in more interactive um, discussion. So yes. I highly encourage uh, participants that you can maybe put your questions in the, um, in the comment section or the, during the, in the Q&A. So that uh, yes, of course. we're in the topic, um, it's a, we can we can stop for a moment since um uh, this topic is very uh relevant in today's society uh today especially here in Southeast Asia. Well, mm. actually, I flew back to Manila just like two hours ago, <laughs> since uh oh, just I, I'm in back. I'm in in uh, Lao, so okay. so I'm I'm doing a lot of uh, business mission there uh, recently. And uh, mm. I also engage with a lot of uh, family businesses there as well. So, okay. and, so yes. it's pretty common in Southeast Asia since almost 90% or 95% are family-run corporations. So, okay. So I guess let's start. And um, I hope uh, you'll be able to get uh, uh, insights from my discussions. Oke, okay, baik. Ya, jadi Bapak Ibu, nanti uh, Prof. Mark akan sangat terbuka sekali untuk uh, tidak hanya materi yang disampaikan saja, tapi lebih ke uh, Q&A-nya. Jadi discussion, ya, two ways. Jadi tidak apa-apa, silakan bertanya di tengah-tengah Prof. Uh, menyampaikan materinya. Bapak Ibu, silakan bertanya. Karena materi ini tidak hanya di Filipina, tapi di South East Asia sangat-sangat saat ini sangat-sangat diperlukan sekali perkembangannya sangat cepat jadi silahkan Bapak Ibu dimanfaatkan kesempatan ini sebaik mungkin kira-kira seperti itu ya Bro uh, while you deliver the material and then uh, it will be open for the audience to ask questions right yes okay yes okay you can start Bro all right Um, please allow me to share my slides. Um, okay. All right. Okay, so let's start. So just uh, as me as mentioned by Ibu, um, just to give you a quick briefer of my uh, consultancy and business advisory engagement. So this is on the left side is most of the companies that I am uh, currently engaged or previously engaged. Some of them are one of the top uh, corporations uh, in the Philippines. Then I also started a few uh, business startups in the Philippines, uh, specifically focus on the consulting and uh, food manufacturing and other service-oriented businesses. On the right side is some of the clients that I previously engaged or currently engaged either in a consultancy capacity or I sit it in their board. And uh, this one is some of, uh, these are some of the institutions that I engaged with back in, during my, both my consulting and business engagements. So, Actually, I'm going to start it with a very uh, dark, very stark question that um, founders uh, often neglect to think about. So what if you die tonight? So it's a pretty, it's a question that uh, many people are trying to avoid. But uh, most of the family businesses, uh, they think that this moment in their life will not going to happen. And they think they're gonna live forever. So most founders, they will always think that they're like Superman, and they will try to work their 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 selves to until they reach a certain age that there's either old or even there they have a lot of uh, of uh, problems in their health, but they're still gonna work because there are few fam there are a lot of uh, family businesses in Asia that. The problem of uh, succession is not being discussed. So that's why many of the family businesses are solely relying on their founders or their keepers, key family members to run their family businesses. But the question of what if you die tonight is a very significant um, question that mostly they're not they are not always talking about. So when the, when a founder die, 
automatically the business die. So it is a grim to think about it, but I highly encourage most of the family business to address it now. Because most of the family businesses who, let's say, if the, the founder is collapsed or incapacitated or even in, 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 even in debt, what would be or how would be the family business would look like during the post-founder scenario? So I guess most of you here right now are like our family-run businesses. So come to think about it. So what will happen if my my if something happens to me, my business, what will happen to my business? So the quicker you get your succession planning in place as a business owner, the better if you're the next generation family will able to transition the family business. So you better hope your family business has it, right? So now you will ask yourself right, right now, do I have a succession planning plan in place in my family business? So in the next couple of minutes, we will be I will be sharing to you some of the things that uh, could probably help you to create your governance and your family succession. So preparing the family business of an imminent debt. So if there's an uh, unexpected debt, Let's approach the debt or incapacity from a person perspective of the perspective first. So the founders own the business. It is highly successful, a group of companies that's being managed by executive, old-time employees, and family business. So it is funded and run by founders together with the family members, right? So preparing your, for the life of your business is it is an aggressive and presently working diversification strategy based on opportunity presented right some companies that were formed have partnership with a team of investors and new sets of expertise so this all of the things are happening in your family business and if it, there's a sudden debt think of it of what will happen to it all of your partners in your investors or your ventures, all of the business strategy, all of the operation-related concerns, all of it will be in disarray if there's no succession plan. So in debt or capacity, either way, it is important for founders of the next and the next generation leaders to make sure all of its risks and rewards are covered, which includes debt planning. So, so... Even at the start of my talk, I'm already addressing the, the most important thing. If what will happen to you if something happened in, in either in case of debt or incapacity. It may not be a glamorous decision as mentioned here, but we have to make sure there is a solid plan. So from a survival, legacy, and continuity perspective of a family business, I would highly argue it is one of the most important. Okay. So while many businesses are that are owner managed by family recognize the importance of ownership and management transition, there are only a few where and how they would be able to start a developing governance and succession plan. So now, if you're if you're seeing this slide right now, please allow me to uh, navigate it through you. So normally the family business, when they started their businesses, it normally it the entrepreneurial takeoff. So let's say for during the founder generation. So as you progress, the family enterprise will grow. Then on the middle part, there will be a transition or a disturbance or turbulence that we usually call. So on that stage, there is what we call the maturity and diminishing returns. So normally, the family businesses on this stage, sometimes they collapse or they start a new one. But the if there is no governance or only informal sets of rules and customs are in place, they will be continuously going on a loop on this maturity and diminishing return cycle. But if you were able to create a governance or a system of rules within your family business, now you will be going further up to the corporate board control with certain rules or governance in place. 
So I'm highly encouraging those family-run businesses here right now to reflect if what are your what your family businesses now currently encountering. Are you on the entrepreneurial takeoff? Or are you now currently experiencing that what we call the maturity and diminishing return? So it is a pretty much a common thing in family businesses because sometimes when they grow their business, you will all they will always think of why why am I not reaching to the next level? Why am I not uh emulating the the big enterprise of uh conglomerates uh in Asia? Why why am I always have that ceiling that I cannot pursue on a different level cannot go on a on a higher level of 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 my family enterprise so you have to reflect that there is a possibility that you're in that maturity and diminishing return so what's the answer you're probably having you have no formal corporate or family governance setup within your within your family business so that's why it's like a continuous cycle of going up and down then you're going to start again a new business or you're going to acquire new assets just to make sure, just to say that your business is growing. But the fact is, most of your, your operation or maybe your family businesses is heating up. Your employees are not well-trained. Professionalism is not in place. You're running the show in an extent that even that the single rupiah needs to be reported to you. So again, it is a not it's a natural cycle that always it has a repetitive and natural cycle for most family that don't pursue or don't have any a sense of form of system and structure within their family business. So this is one example of a family misfortune in Taiwan. So Mayford Foods Corporation is one of the biggest uh, food manufacturing conglomerate in Taiwan. So one Ming Tang, the fifth son of the family, later remarked that misfortune has fallen into their family. So what happened was a two brother they fought for the control of the family of the family business because they were so emotional. There's no succession plan in place when their parent died and they killed each other just to become part of the family to be the the sole leader of the family business. I know you will ask, oh, oh, don't worry, Prof. Dennis, it won't happen to our family business. Yes, this is uh, an isolated cases. But here in the Philippines, we also have this kind of scenario that happened. Since we have no proper succession, there was no clarity. There's no system or rules in place. So a son was killed by his father. So an 83-year-old businessman shot his 50-year-old son just on the simple argument of a business deal that didn't go well for with for the for the father so that the son was so upset of the decision of the father of not pursuing the the deal and their family business deal so when he confronted his father they got heated in the uh, they got heated and the father took the life of his son so imagine taking the life of your family members. You will go to that point in life, in your family business. And it would cause a lot of pain and suffering within the family business. So this is another case of a family feud that without no clear succession. So if you're familiar with Lotte, Lotte is one of the largest one of the largest conglomerate group uh, conglomerate group in South Korea. So the founder, which is Sin Kyu Ho, is, is the general is the is the founder of the Lotte group had has encountered a problem of how to manage his two sons who are vying for his position. Although he already retired as chairman. His uh, eldest son, Shin Dong Hao, was ousted by his uh, youngest uh, sibling. And when the youngest sibling ousted his, uh, his, his brother, older brother, Shin Dong Hao went to his father and 
told him what happened. So the father, being a father, not being a chairman or not being the businessman, he told he cuddled the the oldest son and go went to the to the to the youngest uh, sibling and tell him to re, to give back the position of his eldest son but what the uh, what the youngest uh, sibling did he also ousted his pow father in a power struggle in the lotte group so just imagine this family is has a 90 billion usd annual revenue and they're fighting like a normal family member but the the main effect of the the, the after effect of this business when they fought is all of the company all the employees that are affected of their family feud so what what happened next the father got in jail and he eventually died there so this is one of the few family businesses that suffered a lot of problems and pain in their family because they didn't set any rules or governance within their family so it is a 90 billion company and that is at stake all right so this is a wrong mindset please allow me to share this leader generally is not comfortable with change most of the time of the founders leader does not want to lose control leaders does not want to see outsider or external people in the company so tip this is a typical mindset of most of the family business leaders that are uh by keeping their leadership role within the family business the lack of succession plan will result to the next generation's lack of essential skills and experience. It is also a problem as the next generation would have not been trained and not prepared for the job. So if you notice that wrong mindset of the founder would result lack of succession of plan because most of the founders, they will keep their position or power or even their role. And what will happen is, their next generation will not be able to prepare or train in the role that they were supposed to take once the founder or the leader will retire or transition for the next generation. So again, there is also a problem of unfair promotion. So maybe I can uh, you will be able to reflect that if this happens, most of your employees are out unhappy and demotivated and eventually will leave the company. A lot of family businesses, even though they're trying to employ or hire professionals, there is a very high attrition rate. So most of the cases, if you hire like a middle manager or executive level employees, in three, time, three months or six months time, they will, already res they will resign already. Why? Usually the leaders or the family members who are part of the family business or working on the senior level or the executive level, sometimes they will they will not create a simple system of governance that would be able to allow those employees to provide their experience because they're also confused who to follow and the methods of the doing business are different compared to a corporate setup. And most of the employees, the, the, the well-trained employees or the well, uh, well uh, professional employees has had a lot of experience in a system-oriented organization or, or a corporate well-governed organization. So most of the cases, leaders will ignore experience skills, abilities, and education, and they will choose loyalty and, and employees that stick to them through thick and thin. So probably some of you will have that kind of um, employees in your family business that during your uh, turbulent period, they are so loyal, they stick to you, and the reward is you provided them of stable income, 
stable jobs but the problem is the lack of the lack of experience and skill set that supposedly were going to support your family business so because they're there already you you trusted them completely and you gave them your uh you gave them your guarantee that they will have jobs to, until they retire but for for the governance in the governance perspective this is very dangerous because you're building you're instead of you building your family business and to create a more professionally run organization you're creating an organization that are lack of skills and talent being run on the key persons or the key positions on that organization so it could in the first in the first few years it would be okay but in the wrong long run it would also cause damage in your corporate identity or in your operations in your family business so this one allow me to share to you this so a family business we have like we have a two circle so the family circle and the business circle in the family circle we are always on the emotional side we are inward we are little change because of course family emotions since it's being an emotionally driven um different situation it is a complete opposite of the business circle so the business always provide facts outward and fast change or even innovation on the family business it always overlaps so this overlaps is where the interesting situation so i i'm pretty sure for most family businesses who are here right now there is always a possibility that family matters and business matters are mixed together right so it is important for us if we're going to pursue family governance and succession we really need to have to lessen or to mi to minimize the overlap of family and the business circle the family circle and the business circle okay so conflicts between family and business styles so the family we are always in the emotional side we're entitlement because we're a family member we have the feelings feeling driven all of the family members should be have like an equal look on the family we have like a hierarchy within the family for the res that you need to respect the elders of course discretionary informality privacy harmony and consensus if you look at it on the right side it's completely different so the emotional side it should be on the economic side so you don't do this is business decision by pure emotion pure gut you need to have the economics or the numbers to to support your business decision entitlement it should be earned so if your uh, if your organization is uh, if your family business gives position to your family members through entitlement it's also also an, an, an it's also a very dangerous situation because on the business side any promotions should be earned so i have this like a japanese uh, saying that mo the 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 family businesses should be who is most deserving and most qualified i'll repeat again family business or any businesses should be most deserving and most most deserving and most provided the most provide the, the the thing that they will provide in their family business there should be a qualification that that to merit their position or their titles in the family business so accountability roles clear roles in the family business meritocracy policies in disclosures getting independent directors or external advisors resolving by creating conflict resolution and creating a decision process system 
is the business side. So you will see that each category is a different opposite. So communication is key. So soft communication before hard structures. So if there's no clarity in the roles and the system, there will always be a conflict. So the style of the family and the business style is way different. So that's why you have to really think twice or three times on how you manage your family business. Okay? So please allow me to share to you, this is a Harvard uh, created, uh, we call it the three circle model of the family businesses. So in this model, we have the family circle who is the the part of the of this circle is basically the family members family members that either working or not working to the family business the other model is the business circle which is there will be possible there are non family members who are working in the family business there are also family members who are working in the family business but not the owners. And lastly is the ownership circle, which is family members that are not working in the family business. And they're also family business, family members that are working who has shares to the company. So, and lastly, they're also non-family owners, non-family owners who also have shares. So possibly there will be like, there should, there's there's a possibility that they're in the joint ventures in their, and the multiple family families are controlling or owning the family or fa owning the family business. So this three circle models is your basis, your navigation when you think of your family, what is the system of your family business? So at the center, you will notice that the territory one, he is he or she is either the founder of the business, because all of the the, the business the the circle, the govern or or the types of circles he occupies it, so he is the number one on the territory one. On the territory two, the family members who work in the business but do not have ownership, so again. Maybe your kids right now is working in the family business, but they don't still they still don't have the shares or they don't have the voting powers that support that are solely reserved to the owners or the founders. On the territory tree, the family members who are owners but do not work in the family business. So normally this is of the family members that are either they only receive uh, dividends, but they don't part they don't uh partake or they do not have a certain position or titles in the operation of the family business territory 4 it includes the spouses and in-laws that are not working the children or they chosen the different careers outside the family business so that's a uh, territory 4 the number 5 is people working in the business who also have owners ownership. So probably your external partner, your non-family partners. Territory six, all non-family executive and employees working in the family business. So they are your employees. And lastly, the territory seven, owners and shareholders who are not part of the family and do not work in the family business. So basically, these are the family, uh, these are the shareholders. So now, if you look at this diagram, think of it where you are right now. So you can chat it in the group chat. Okay, mm, silakan Bapak Ibu menuliskan di uh, Q&A ya. Mm -hmm. Di posisi mana Bapak Ibu gitu ya. Is it right, Prof? Uh, the audience should write uh, in what position are they? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. They can put it like uh, I'm in the one, I'm the, I'm the two, I'm the four, the three. 
So, Oke, okay. and later we will ask them to explain ini ya, Via. Oh, ini ada dari Pak Ahmad Junaidi. Seks katanya. Aha. To Fanny also. Oke. Okay. Oke, okay, from Stephanie One. Mm -hmm. Oh, various two oh, yeah. from Sinta, Bu Sinta, ya. Yeah. So this is nice. We have a uh, we have a uh, non family. We also have a uh, okay. family members. So second and four. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Six two. So I'm I'm seeing a lot of six. So it okay. means uh, you're working on a family business, and I'm not sure, but you're probably struggling <laughs> on the system <laughs> and structures that's currently happening. But don't worry, don't worry, guys. You're part of the 99% <laughs> of all <laughs> family businesses in South in Asia, particularly in Asia, specifically in our region, because mm -hmm. uh, most of the family businesses in Southeast Asia are still heavily relying on a family mom and pop style business mom and pop style yes. business <laughs> so <laughs> don't worry. the father okay. set it up the, the 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 husband and wife they created the family business mm -hmm. then they get their initial employees without proper employment system okay because they trusted then they the family grew same system again Then in the, when there was like a little bit of system of uh, employment, eventually many professional came in. But the problem is, the question is, if you try to um, compare or do a market comparison of the positions that you have right now, since I'm seeing a lot of six here, do you think your family business or your, the one that, that you're currently working right now is at par With let's say with the publicly listed companies or the medium size or the large enterprise within mm. your specific industries. Okay. So that's a good reflection that you can think about it. Of course, you cannot you can say, oh now give me some raise. Uh, prop, because Prop Dennis told me that you're not at par. At par. Uh, so I'm not saying like that, guys. <laughs> so th this is a good reflection for you. For both family members who are working in the family business. Those who are founders here that also are uh, watching and as well as the professionals. So see, you will see that there is a disparity or there's some uh, potential conflicts within the family business. The reason why I'm sharing this to you, this circle models, the three circle model is going back to the first topic that I mentioned that if what if you die tonight? So specifically the... <laughs> the founders that are watching right now, if something happens to you, you're number one, who and who will take over that position? Mm -hmm. So possibly, yours, of course, the automatic will be either your spouses or your children. But the problem is, let's say if your pro, if your, if your, Children are currently working in the territory too, but only taking uh, minor jobs or not on the same level of what you're currently doing right now. What will happen if something, uh, you are in the, if something happens to you, what will happen to them? They will plunge on a specific role. You being the founder that controls everything, you own the shares. You own the business and you are also the head of the family. Mm -hmm. So how how the next generation without proper succession can navigate this? Mm -hmm. Normally, as a as a children, of course, we we as a family, we normally do is um when we invite or when we forcefully tell to our children that guys, you have to join the family business. Of course, being a patriarchal society, we will always say yes and we will follow you. The, the, the children will follow, the son and daughter will follow his or her, the father or the mother because it's out of, of, of because of the parent parental love, because of your family relations. So when you follow them, 
sometimes the the founder will always will just tell them okay son just follow me whatever i do just follow me so imagine if you have like five siblings and they love and the father told them just follow him without system and rules and if something happens to him what will happen so all of this all of them probably will vie for the power and the position of the father because all of them are bred or trained to become next emperor so that's why we call it the chinese emperor or the patriarchal system because in asia many of the family businesses are being set up or being run on a patriarchal control or matriarchal control that whatever the the decision of the founder would probably the the final decision he is the executor the legislative and the judicial <laughs> so so it happens it's pretty common in most of the family businesses here so that's why it's really crucial for us to acknowledge first that we have there's something missing in our system in our family business and there is no clarity of rules and rules so later i will share to you the 4 hours and 1a and it and i hope it would reflect into you during these discussions okay so again going back to that scenario if something happens to the family member these numbers these territories will going to move so like the sibling, the children will move either on the first or either on the third or they will move completely outside on the fourth. There's also a possibility that if a professional, very trusted by the founder, from number six, so since most of you are on the six, so there's a possibility that if you're trusted by your founder or your business owner, the business owner, you can move on the first or on the fifth. So there's a lot of changes and movements in this situation that just one big event or one unexpected event. So you have to be ready as a family business. This is not just for the family members, but as well as for the professionals. Okay, so is this clear? This this uh, uh this business cycle, this this business circle, this tree circle model that we are discussing, you can use this as a reference on how you reflect yourselves in the family business. So here, we also have this stages of ownership. Please allow me to, uh, explain this to you. So most of the cases when you started a family business. They are in this stage. So if you look, look at the on the rights on the left side, the left side is a representation of a family business on their initial or their startup stage. So you have a controlling owner, which is the founder. Every decision is unilateral. There's no board or directors meeting. There's no discussion. If whatever the founder is uh, saying or wants to decide, the entire organization will just follow. It is a bit authoritarian. As I said, it is a founder generation uh, system. It can be an, a sibling, but most of the time it is in the founder system. So this system is very quick, easy, easy decision making. You no longer need to ask someone or ask uh, an independent director or consultants. And it is very simple. The decision can, the, uh, even a multi-million dollar decisions can be made on that moment. Now, just imagine if you're in, you're in the second stage, which is we call it the sibling. So if you notice here, if we go on to the next stage, which is we call it the sibling area. So the decision making now is you need sibling partners that would discuss a decision making sometimes it it will turn out into an intense and volatile relationship because when your children grows 
they will leave your house and create their own culture within their family. And that culture will be heavily influenced, of course, by their future spouse and as well as their children. Of course, back then when you're still young, most of the siblings will have like a simple um, discussions and they will fix it. But as they grew and they eventually do their separate lives, there will be some interest involved that are no longer aligned or probably more they are more taking care of themselves rather than the entirety of the family business. So it would there be a possibility of intense volatile relationship and it also be more diverse unlike before when the only the mom and the father do the decision making. So it is a higher risk of potential conflict. So the next, the last stage, or actually it's not the last stage, the, the, the third stage is on the right side is what we call the cousin federation. So the cousin federation, if you reach this level of your family business, there should be a form of democratic decision because now you have more family members joining the family business that have different set of skill set or different point of view. Then imagine there's also a disbursement or disbursement of ownership to the entire family business because it's no longer held by one or two or three or even five people. It will be held by multiple family members with small share amounts, small percentage. So each family members or whoever is in the board of a family of a cousin federation or the third stage, imagine if they're not aligned or they don't have the same values or there's no clear succession rules, it would be chaotic. So that's why in this stage, there should be rules and fair processes in the family business. And the personal there there should be a loss of personal interest because if this in the cousin federation if you have a personal interest within your family then you are no longer creating a collective effort of making sure the family legacy will survive so now you have to reflect so my next question is for among the participants here, who are on this stage? What are your stages here right now? So you can say first is the controlling owner. Second, two is the, the sibling partnership. And three is the cousin feder confederation. So can I get some comments from the chat? Okay, silakan Bapak-Ibu ditulis kembali di chat. Ya, posisi Bapak Ibu di stage of ownership-nya. Eh, apakah yang pertama controlling owner atau sibling partnership or cost confederation? Oke. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oke. Okay. Oh, from oke, okay. sibling controlling controlling Number one means controlling owner, yeah. Okay, and then sibling. Uh, okay. Various. Controlling still one and two, bro. So you're on the on the left stage. So yes. there's still a lot of time for those who are in the first stage. Oh. The second stage, you still have time. Don't worry. <laughs> still have time. In the Don't middle. Worry. In the middle. Yeah, in the middle. So okay. actually some of them some of my clients I always ask them what mm -hmm. stages are you right now mm -hmm. and uh, okay. how do you reflect or how do you uh see your family business on this how do you in, how do you compare it to these categories so because if you go to the third stage and you still don't have a certain level of governance within your family it can be very chaotic in your family business. Okay? So I'll proceed. Yes. Is okay. him finished? 
Oh, okay. Let me check. Yeah. No more response? All right. Okay. So here, so the legacy planning starts with the family, with the founder. Since at the end of the day, sometimes they will tell you, oh, no, uh, the, the, the third generation rule, they said, right? They will say that the first generation will create the, fam the business, the second generation will expand, and the third generation will destroy or they will uh, mess it up. So, but I believe it will all going to start or it will start in the founding generation. Because if the founder is not uh, open-minded or there is no sense of urgency of implementing governance, the, 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 the founder, once he's passed away or transferred the power to the next generation, these are the typical scenario that might happen to them. So the founder either sell the business, liquidate the assets, they can also professionalize it, appoint a caretaker of the family business if, it, if, if the family member are not qualified, or appoint a family member that would succeed. And of course, the best answer is the do nothing. <laughs> and normally, this is the, the decision of most of the founders. They will say that, okay, I'm, I'm okay. I'm still strong. Don't worry. I will run my family business. I am, I'm going to live 100 years. So the do nothing approach is always the legacy planning of most founder, which is very unfortunate. There are some founders that are very brilliant that what they do is when they start their business, they will not give it to their next generation or their children. They will sell it. So why? Because for them, if they give the family business to their children who is unprepared, not qualified, what will happen? They will exploit, they will mess it up, and eventually it will collapse. So the 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 one very popular um, Chinese person who did this is Jackie Chan. He started his uh, career uh, art, being an artist, a martial artist. He was able to create businesses, but he decided not to give it to his family member, to his children, because he knows his family members are not qualified to run the business. So some of the businesses he Sell, sold it or he let professional run it. So that's a question or that's my challenge for those the founders who are here. And also some of the sibling uh, members who are currently the head of the family business. Because there's some here probably that are on the second generation already. Probably your founder or your parents are already passed away. So this is a challenge for you that you have that decision. What will be your legacy plan before you retire? Or if you're really planning to retire. <laughs> because a lot of family founders, they think that their life is the family business. So allow me to challenge that perspective later as we go along in this, in this session. So, the problem of some family, most of the family business challenges is too much family and not enough business. Is it right? Am I right? <laughs> too much family matters that affects the family business or they, they're not even discussing about business matters. They're mixing family problems to the business. So like, for example, if you're, trying to lure a potential client or potential uh, business uh, opportunities, sometimes you will make a decision purely emotional or purely because you don't like your family member or you have like a conflict within your siblings. 
So if you use that kind of uh, decision making in the family business, you will not be able to get the best deal in the business side. So that's why try to minimize family matters, but focus more on the business matter. So sometimes we will call um, one example. If you're in the office, I'm pretty sure the founder, probably the founder, will be arriving in the office at as early as 7 a.m. Then the children, most of the time, will arrive what time? 11 a.m. Sometimes lunchtime. So they will feel that entitlement because their father is the founder. And the father cannot discipline because he or she is his son or daughter. So that's why he will manage his sons and daughter on a family way, not as a CEO or president of the company. So that would cause confusion within the family business, especially your employees, because your employees will think, oh, come on, my my boss, the, the son of the founder is late again, or they are always going on the lunchtime. While we are working hard, going in and out in the office. So what would what would it cost to the family business? It would cost questions of credibility of your family members. So if there's no rules, there's no governance, it will continue and would build uh, it will build division within the family business. It's not no longer the family itself, but as well as your employees. So that's why too much family is, is a problem, is a ticking time bomb for your family business. And I would highly recommend to focus on business. Business means your numbers, your data, your professional, trusting them at least, give them some sense of ownership of what they do in their business and create a system or structure that is well-written for the entire family business to follow. Again, the entirety of the family business, not only a few. So that's why many of the sons and daughters of family businesses, they're being called SOB, son of business owners. So it's a bad word, but you know, it's a it's a prevalent word being used by the non-family, by the employees to them. All right. So as I mentioned again, succession planning, most of the most of the time, the do nothing option is being chosen by the founders or the family business. But it is the least logical, the most costly, because when they fight, they will drag it to the courts or it would cause a lot of, uh, of unnecessary expenses. The most destructive, as it would hurt people's lives, yet sadly, by far the most popular. So are we on that stage, the do-nothing option as a founder or maybe as a business leader of your family business? So if you don't initiate the process, the do-nothing option will always be your uh, option, the priority option. So you have to think, rethink the way you think right now. Since if something happens to you and if you didn't prepare anything, it would cause chaos in your family business. So the transition in continuity is should be instead of ownership transition, it should be it would be transcended to a leadership transition. So you no longer think of you being an owner only of the family business, but the leader of the family business. It's a different uh, thing being an owner and a leader. 
on the financial assets, many family businesses, they try to uh, keep the financial aspect of the family business within the family. But sooner or later, you, you'll arrive or you'll encounter challenges because the financial aspect should be on a sharing power and authority. Why? Because if you're not qualified on making sure your financial financials are up to date or at the green, and without trusting your professionals and hiring the right people, you'll get in trouble eventually because you're only deciding based on your own decisions, not through a well-written or well-planned financial planning within your family business. Now, as a shareholding structure, very linear in your current situation, you need to prepare as well as early as now for the next generation or you have like a game plan or like a solid plan for succession preparation. Now, the most challenging is the stewardship of your family business. It means that you're no longer thinking the family business is as your own, but you're only a steward of the family business. Or you're just there to take care of it, not to squander it. In most cases, it's hard as you're in the process of letting it go or letting go of that power. So I'm pretty sure most of your family businesses has this predicament of how to, to let go some of your authority. Because sometimes you will see, oh no, my professionals are not qualified to, to decide. They don't know what, I'm, I'm, I'm much better on judgment. Yes, definitely. That's one of the, one of the brilliance of uh, being a founder. Because you have that uh, business acumen that you were able to accumulate through the years. But remember, your all your enemy will always be time, because as you age, you start to lose that capability, and at a certain level, your health will also be your a factor for you to eventually think twice if you're making the right decision. All right, so. As, uh, as I mentioned earlier, wealth shall not pass three generations. Unfortunately, many Southeast Asian uh, or even Asian countries, family businesses encountering this kind of uh, situation that when they reach the third generation, the family business either collapsed or it will be redistributed because they can no longer work together as a family business. So this is a challenge for me, for all of those, uh, the participants here that are in the family business that can, if you think think of it now, can my family business pass beyond three generations? As I mentioned earlier, it's not always the third generation's fault that this situation happens. It could be probably in the second, in the first generation because they didn't prepare. They didn't create a plan, a solid plan for succession of their family business. So that's why the survivability percentage of the third, the second and third generation is very low here in Asia. So, okay, before I move on, uh, do you have any questions or do you want to share your thoughts about the discussion that I uh, that I gave? Oke, okay. silakan Bapak Ibu. Mungkin ada yang ingin ditanyakan dari Prof. Dennis. Mungkin uh, ada yang sama, punya pengalaman sama, bu boleh di-sharing di sini. Silakan. Atau mau ada pertanyaan? Menarik sekali ya. Family business will run only till third generation. Seperti itu ya, Prof. Ya, yeah. is it? Only till three generations. That's the fact so far. Mm -hmm. Oke. Okay. 
it's a grow it's a fact it's a it's really happening right now as you really happening as as you're sitting here and watching my talks talk right now yeah. there is also there's a possibility that one of your friends who are in the family business are closing down because of of that situation so just imagine during the pandemic maybe you you heard a lot of family businesses that permanently closed permanently closed yeah yes actually i have uh, i had the experience i mean uh when i was in uh my hometown i just saw a family a chinese there yeah, having a great business uh many kinds of business but it's no longer uh exist for now it collapsed uh -huh. close i don't know yeah uh no children uh, continue the business mm -hmm. and actually i i get the reason okay that's really uh really a fact actually yeah, yeah. so mm -mm. it's like yes, a so. it's really a trend that's happening that up to mm. the third generation um most of the family business will have their what we call inflection point mm. that they will okay. ask themselves that if they really want to run this family business and it the burden of decision making will falls to the third generation or maybe even the second generation because sometimes there's some scenarios that even at the second generation the family business will collapse mm. when they reach the third generation as i mentioned the decision makers now will have different points of view Oh, okay. they will have their own perspective, perspective in the family business. They will also have different culture because mm. it's already a mixture of two culture because of their parents. Mm. So the prioritization or their priorities in life may not be on the for the family business as they will pursue more mm. on themselves. So that's why there's a, a deep, uh, there's a sharp uh decline of survivability decline. of most of the family gener mm -hmm. family businesses so that's why my next topic will will give you insights on how or how can we be able to prevent it but again in my experience in dealing with family businesses it's really not just you create a certain document or you create a uh system of rules it is more on how you put your mindset to it. Mm. Like for in my experience, it will take me at least one year or even two and two years just to make the family realize the importance of embracing a change of mindset of doing family businesses in, in making in making decisions or creating or how they will be able to embrace governance within their family business. Because you cannot change immediately like a 30-year-old or 40-year-old mindset on a one-year or two-year uh, training or a four-day or one-day session. So even me right now, I'm talking to you. There is a possibility that you will try to resist. You uh, will think about that. Oh, this oh, no. doesn't know what he's saying because I'm doing my business I'm so uh my I'm so rich. How can he tell me what I want? How how I, I can run the business? Mm. There there's a possibility that you guys are trying to resist as well. But as you realize, the time is ticking. <laughs> like yeah. I said, you will never you right. will, you won't see this family business like a hundred years from now because father time will always win. <laughs> He always <laughs> wins, so that's why I'm really telling that straightforward to my to my friends and colleagues and even my clients that if you didn't do, if you don't initiate the process, if there's something happens, if something happens to you, you'll get in trouble. Not just you, but the entire organ, or entire family the business. Family. Okay. It mm -hmm. seems that we have a question, bro. Okay. Okay. Let me read first. 
Okay, it's from Miss Stephanie. Thank you, Miss Stephanie, for the question. Let me read. In your experiences, what kind of business has the most probability to survive? In that terms are, of family runs business. Okay. Thank are you. Are you referring to uh what type of business or industry? Yes, it is bro. Okay. Because if you ask me, all of them <laughs> has a lot of risk. Because uh if you notice in some family, most of the family businesses, either in the tech sector, either in the either in the food, manufacturing, logistics. Name it. <laughs> Generally, the, the 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 survivability is low. It's not because actually the the question should be, uh, in what generation there is a possibility of point of conflict. So, in your while you're in the founding generation, it is pretty much easy because like I shared to you earlier, this one, it's easy to the stages in the in this table the stage of ownership if you're on the left side you're still okay you can create unit you can do unilateral decisions very easy you make decisions very fast and it's very simple most of the cases the founders will put that system on the next stage and when the when you move on the next stage that's the time that there is there is a possibility of volatility within your family business. So, regardless, to answer your question, it really depends. It, it's not the matter of industry because each industry can get problems in terms of, can, can, can have a problem of their succession if they, if the founder or the family business members are not prepared. Like I said, it is a mindset. It's a mindset that you have to rethink while you are still alive, while you're still strong, while you're still had the capacity, you have the still sharp in mind that can change or initiate the process of embracing governance. So that's how it is. So regardless of industry, there's no industry factor. There is an there is a possibility that if you go public, so that's another that's another situation. So if your company goes to public, if you go IPO, now the regulators will come in. The regulators now will enforce corporate governance within the family business. And that would be much dangerous. Why? Because if your family business is not prepared, if your family business is, is still being run like a mom and pop shop, then you have the, you really have a vision that, no, no, I want to take this company in public. Okay. But the bureaucracy of having an IPO company, a, a publicly listed company, is very difficult or very challenging if your organization is not prepared. So if the regulators comes in and you didn't provide the data, you probably get eventually delisted. If you try to manipulate your numbers, you'll get caught. Because why? Being in a publicly listed company, you're now part now the public owns it. So being owned by the public, the government can step in. So I'm not sure if you have the same uh, situation in the Philipp in Indonesia, but in the Philippines we we are. So if you if you go to public, you're now in the scrutiny on the eyes of the public. So anything that you do, any messed up that you incurred during your in your family business as a publicly listed company and since you have no rules you're only there because you're required and you didn't embrace it wholeheartedly then it would also cause problem okay okay demikian tadi miss stephanie Jadi, no matter the business is, yeah, uh, the preparation 
uh, about the business itself is really important about how we'll continue the business, how we prepare about everything. Yeah, even if we, if we want to make our business go public, yeah, we have to make great preparation for that. Is that Prof? Yes, yes. Yes. Kira-kira yes, seperti itu, Bu Stephanie ya. Tidak yes. masalah bisnisnya apa, tapi persiapannya. Ya, baik itu penerusnya, baik manajemennya, seperti itu. Oke, okay. go on. Uh, we still have one more question, Prof. Mm -hmm. oh, two, actually. Is it possible for this session? Two questions? Ya, yeah. two. Oke, okay, saya batasi dua dulu ya. Nanti mungkin masih ada penjelasan lain dari Prof. Dennis. Uh, the second question, in general, what is the key to a successful intergenerational transition process in a family business? Mm -hmm. Actually, I also wait for this one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. What is the most okay. successful uh, thing that you need to do? Yeah, from the first generation into yeah. at least the third generation, you know, yeah. <laughs> there should be <laughs> or maybe clear... long lasting. Yeah. There <laughs> should be a clear communication within the family. Okay. So as long as the family members are talking, then there is a form of uh there could be a possible consensus of what you the things that you do. But as long as you talk you resolve. So that's my tip. You talk, you resolve. Mm. So any any discussions that you want to discuss within the family, there should be a proper communication line. So now, the question is, what if, if we're just talking and then eventually we're just fighting and shouting? So that's why there should be a system of rules of, of governance within the family. So when you talk, you follow a certain rules or protocols on how you communicate. Since if there is no communication within the family, then you're already in trouble. <laughs> because it means that the two family members or the family members will no longer resolve it through a diplomatic channel, but they will resolve it on a more legalistic manner. So as long as family members can still talk, talk things around, talk things up about the situation, create a system of discussion, a rules, then that could be a, that would resolve or at least help the transition of a family member to a more governed organization or more governed family business. So you will ask what kind of uh, communication? So just one example, if you're in the board of directors meeting of your family members, Create a system like what we are currently doing in the publicly listed companies or a or a multinational companies. You create a formal letters. Topic of discussion should be a, should be created prior weeks prior at least seven days, and create do a minute taking while well, during the during the meeting. Create a quorum. A, so, a sense of quorum within the within the discussion there should be rules who needs to who are need what are the the programs or events that needs to be discussed during that discussion so if you implement a simple basic simple rules in that type of meeting then you'll start a more clear communication within your family so this is just one example so did I answer your question? Okay. Pak Ahmad Junaidi, kira-kira dapat ya. The key oh. is communication. Yes. Silakan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, for all the problems, communication is the most important key for running your business. Yeah. Especially for family business. Gitu ya. Everything. Uh, talk and solve katanya ya kita berkomunikasi ngomong dan menyelesaikan masalah oke okay. go on oh actually <laughs> we have another question oke okay. just what I have promise eh, seperti janji saya tadi kita ke uh, 
pertanyaan dari Bu Sinta dulu. The question from Miss Sinta Sari. Just in case there are no children, would not to continue or do not want to continue the family business uh, hmm. when if the uh, when the the owner passed away, what should we do? Oh yeah, very interesting question. Um, I would not uh, give the guns blazing to advise you that. Oh uh, yeah, you need to hire professionals and everything. Again, like you asked, like since like I mentioned earlier, if there's no proper succession plan, it means that you don't have uh, a system of qualification or programs, training programs that would provide a system of succession within your family business. Because right now, let's say you mentioned that uh, what if they're not qualified? But if the family business don't have that qualifying system or qualification program, how can you, how can we determine? So that's why it's important for your family business to set up a qualification system or like a rules, a certain rules that would vet or train the next generation. Then, during that process, you will be able to determine through data and performance of those family members if they're qualified or not. So again, like the, the keyword there is qualification program or qualification system. If they didn't pass that qualification system, some of the well uh, governed family businesses, of course, they will event they will get it to the non-family members, non-family member who are professionals. But again, if your organization is not ready to get professionals, your family business will just incur expense by hiring a professional, but the professional cannot do things professionally in the family business because of the system of your family business it's not at par in the industry standards so that's how that's how you will be able to determine if on where or who will take over if your family if your family members are not qualified you get a professional but i would caution you if your organization is also not ready for that professional eventually he will he or she will leave you they will leave the company because they will feel that the system inside the family business are not comparative to what they were doing when they were still working in the organization or companies that are more system driven organization so if also if you get employees from your from your current pool talent pool then you need to create a system on how to vet or qualify those who are planning or who are interested to take over the family business. Okay? So yes, it's a, yes. a bit com it's a bit complicated to answer because there is because again it will go back to the system to the question that are your organization has a system of governance that would allow them to come in to take over the business, either family or non-family. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Prof. Dennis. Uh, Ms. Sinta, so uh, let me wrap up from the uh, answer, from Prof. Dennis' answer. That is, you have to make a preparation. Yeah. Even uh, not only from your family, non, uh, but it may come from uh, outside. Yeah. Make sure that you make the qualified system about it yeah hire a professional yeah non family yeah you have to prepare for that if uh, there is no uh, family uh, there is no children in your family is that jadi yes is that okay jadi uh, kalau tidak ada uh, family atau generasi berikutnya yang melanjutkan maka kita harus menyiapkan sebuah sistem atau program yang uh, berkualitas qualified gitu ya training yang berkualitas sehingga 
profesional atau non family tadi bisa melanjutkan uh, bisnis kita sesuai dengan apa yang kita lakukan selama ini. Jadi memang kosnya tinggi, but you uh, kita harus menyiapkan itu. Kira-kira seperti itu. Oke, okay. actually we still have one more question, Prof. What should we do? Is it possible? Ya, yeah, we can. Okay. Yes, go on. It should be the last, ya. Yeah. Based on your ex observation, what is the best family business in the world? Oh, Wrong okay. Model for family business and what make it so good? Thanks. Yeah, okay, don't worry. Um, okay. I, that would be answered. I will be sharing to you some companies, uh, that that are like that have like a successful family business in the in the latter part. So yeah, you will will do that. Okay. Jadi jawabannya ditunggu nggih Pak Aji Tono setelah ini nanti sambil dijelaskan di slide berikutnya. Oke. Okay. Yes, right. thank you Prof. You may go on. Oke. Okay. So now we will be uh, I will be sharing to you a document or a a certain written rules or written paper that would allow your family to put your legacy. So again, the mindset should be by the most of the, the founders should be legacy building. But the problem is they want to build their legacy, but they're not writing it. <laughs> so if like so most of the cases in the business side, if it's not written, it's not existing. So the question is, your family, how you will be able to put your values, your culture, that would allow the next generation be able to embrace or to emulate with. So that's why family constitution or family charters are vital to the success of your family business if you want to implement governance within your family business. So again, by creating this charter or constitution, it is a form of governance within your family since you're gonna write it and you have to implement it so family constitution family constitution or charter is it acts like a roadmap it is it's where we've been where we are and where we we're going it helps the family business to stay the course and keep from losing their way. So the roadmap are also, or the family constitution is useful in the personal lives, careers, and especially the family unity of the family business. So in any family, the best thing that you need to prepare is by crafting your own family, quest, family constitution as it defines the goals and values recognize these functions and how it be able to resolve and support the family relationships so this is the the that this is a that this is the meaning of the family constitution it is a roadmap it provides a definition of your goals and values of your family business so in the future when your next generation reads it, they need to embrace or embody it through a written statement or a written word from the family. So that when every succeeding generation, they will understand what is the value that the family business wants for their entire generation, for, for the next generation. So, as it score, a family constitution clearly spell out who and what your family is and isn't by setting up boundaries and foundation. So again, this is a this is a system of rules that are that is written in the fam in which is the family constitution contains should contain. So the process can help include or involve family members or family branches that have not had a role to play or to or that have started to become distanced from the family business 
this process or the process therefore helps to rebuild emotional commitment to the family business. So again, the, the, the one thing that the family governance needs to address is the emotional, the family side. Remember the family circle? Because on the family circle, if we don't create a certain governance system there, it will always be driven through emotion. Now, if you have a document that would allow to control or to govern that emotion, it, as I mentioned, it, it would be a emotional commitment. So a family constitution, we normally called it a semi-legal paper. So it's a, so it's a form of a social, uh, it's like a moral document. So it is a form of a document that is pertaining the values and vision of the family. So the rules what that will be in place there is always aligned to the values of the family. So it helps to clarify the rules which eventually avoid conflicts or role conflicts within the family. And of course, it also become a tool for arbitration. So that rule or that constitution, you will see to it that this is a, <clears throat> there is certain provisions that would provide details on how you will be able to clarify the activities or the rules and the rights of each family member. So it also helped to forge family commitment to the future of the business. Because normally the family charter or family constitution, they the family needs to sign it. Because the, the, the reason they will sign it, because they were able to read and digest this constitution and they will have the obligation to follow the the family constitution or the family charter so over time the ownership is more important than the management so defining the ownership role is a key task of this document and lastly it can provide a framework for decision making so again family constitution and charter provides a framework of decision making. So again, it is a governance system that would allow that to your family business. So normally my role as a family business advisor, remember the three circle model, right? So on the business side, on the family side, we are like the, the family therapist. <laughs> The business system will we will always we will like we will be like a certain level of uh, consultants on the business strategy, and on the ownership is more on the estate plan and the succession. So normally I cover that I guide or advise family businesses to through this on on all of those circles. So our role is the process of advising. And the task force to allow the family members to have a agreement on those content of the family constitution. So we will be plotting the we will be most of the cases that I engage in. We create the foundation of the shared values, vision of the family, the desire structure and policies and process, and the implementation of that rules or that document. So because even though you create a family constitution or char charter right now, if it is not implemented, then it would be on waste. It would put into waste all the efforts that you do. Because if there's no implementation, there will be no changes in the system of family of your family while you're doing your business. And of course, while you're implementing the rules within the family constitution, it is a living document. We call it a living document because by on time to time, it's being reviewed and revised as it 
as it adapt to the changing times. Okay? So the governance structure is, this is how it looks like, to be more sustainable and more governed. So once you created the family assembly, you create councils and implement the most critical role, critical point is the policies. You create a well-defined shareholders group. Create a more stable corporate board, corporate structure. And eventually on the right side, you preserve your wealth. So that's why some of the big family businesses, they create their own investment office or family offices and family foundation. So because if you are on that stage, since you're now a more governed organization, family business, you need to preserve the wealth. So normally, big companies like successful conglomerates are on this stage already on the investment and family foundation side. So in your case, you have to focus on the first level on the left side, how to create a system of rules within your family business that every member, every family member should adhere. Okay? But for me, the process is more important than the written work product. So as you go along to the process of creating policies, creating rules and structure within your family business through the family constitution, you need to embrace or enjoy the process of doing it. Because if, you, if you're just looking on the end product, because I have a few clients that just uh, like telling me, uh, Prof, um, just do the family constitution. Uh, our lawyers will take care of it and that's it. If you're that kind of founder, that constitution will you'll just throw it to the trash can bin because you didn't put their effort or you didn't uh, participate to the process of creating it. That's why I'm telling you since the beginning uh, earlier of our discussion, it is a mindset change that the founders needs to adapt or embrace. So if you're on also on the sibling generation, you need to you need to have a common ground within your family and allow the process to work so that when you will be able to craft that family constitution by heart by mind and soul you'll be able to understand the importance of this since you undergo the process so as I mentioned earlier, there is an inflection point. So allow me to explain this to you. So if you notice, you could probably be on this particular stage. On the inflection point of family businesses, we have that's what we call the super entrepreneurs, which is would go alongside of what we call the childhood stage of a family business. So if you're like this, normally being a su super entrepreneur, their, their, their goal and their family business is accessing always the capital. So when you access the capital, you do your, do your business, you expand. Then as you move along to the stages of uh, the inflection point, you will realize the amount of revenue is much less compared to to the other side which is the institutional level or what we call the adolescence to adulthood so you will maybe you can reflect now that why am i always needing to get access to capital even though i define the strategy i always goes back goes back to the accessing capital so like for instance if you're running the business now there will be a point that you need to get loans again get investors or Use your money to support your your business that are currently in red and in, in negative. So you will always ask yourself, why am I have that repetitive cycle of being a super entrepreneur only? And you will sooner you realize that you're already on the third stage or you're the third generation. And you don't have any time left to turn around your business or to make it more sustainable or move 
to the next stage. Because if you see here, as you move along to the adolescent stage, you're now on the process of building an organization. So most of the publicly listed companies uh, like here in the Philippines is in this stage. But if you go further, like you will be able to manage complexities of your organization, which is the starting point of the adult adulthood of the family inflection family business inflection point you'll see the likes of mermark or sig from singapore that are their revenue streams are way past the 10 billion mark 10 billion dollar because they will be able to cope up with the bureaucracy of that of this kinds of institutional level family businesses so see you will see the stark difference from an, from a super entrepreneur. Their revenue is limited. Their revenue is won't be able to shoot up at the same level of those family businesses that can manage complexities and coping up on bureaucracies. Okay? Sometimes. You... Okay. I will play a video. Uh, it is a Filipino company that uh, emphasize the importance of family governance and succession. Sometimes you just have to take a step back and then you end up having being two steps forward. What are your tips for family businesses with, with regards to investing in talent? We believe that at the end of the day, this corporation will destined to be family owned, but not necessarily family run. Not everybody in the family will want to be in the company or will even be qualified to be in the company. It will always be based on meritocracy. It will always be based on whether they have a, a sound ambition or plan or a vision for the company. We have taken the philosophy as early on that not everybody will really be entitled to work in the company. It's not a birthright. It has to be earned. It has to be based on your experience, based on your merits, based on your vision, your drive. With that, we know that the, the ones who will be eventually running the show will be really the executives and the professionals who are non-family members but are equally important. And so we've established that there really should be three branches in running a corporation. It's really, especially a family corporation. You have the family members that are passive shareholders, basically. They're shareholders, but they make, they make no decisions on company operation. Then you have family members who are part of the organization. So these are family members that have specific roles or jobs or maybe even part of the board of the corporation or the companies. Then you have non-family members who are just basically there. You know, they're there to, to, to run or to manage um, certain things or certain parts of the business or the businesses. All these three must have a, sy a synergistic relationship. It's important for you us to establish a culture wherein we respect hierarchy, we respect seniority, we respect the organization chart, and that we not no way disrupt that for any family member or for any instance. We must follow that org chart, we must follow that succession plan for even our executives and managers as well. And we never should you should never change that, no matter who comes into the company, no matter what happens. All right. So okay. were you able to catch a phrase there that um very critical? They meant they mentioned he mentioned that a family business, there is a ty different two types. A family owned, but not necessarily family run. So in their company, it's called the Alliance Global. This is one of the uh, big conglomerates here in, in the Philippines. They own basically the largest um, brandy and uh, spirits uh, 
in the Philippines, uh, not just in the Philippines, but all over the world. And they're also into retail, which is the McDonald's brand. They're also one of the largest real estate here in hotels in the Ville They accumulated with the mass of 3.1 billion US dollars um, in, in, their, in their portfolio. So just in th that guy, Mr. Kevin Tan, is the son of the founder, who is uh, Mr. Uh, Dr. Andrew Tan, who is a Chinese immigrant from Fujian province, started business in his career in the Philippines in the real estate segment. So he was able to build the business, but through professionalizing the family business, he was able to get the best talent of the, of the country and hire the right people and give them the right decision making or give them the 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 trust so even in the alliance global it is a publicly listed company they only have like what seven board members and five of them are professional so that's how the level of trust that they the family gave to the professionals as they make the decisions lot of decisions to the entire conglomerate and Mr. Kevin Tan is just like uh, in his early 40s. He already succeed his father as the group CEO of the company. So at age of 40, 40 is already the group CEO of this entire conglomerate. So why? Because this guy, he was able to get the best training because he was under a lot of professional CEOs. He worked below them and he was able to train a lot from them. So meaning he treat himself as an employee. He didn't treat himself as a business owner or a family business owner. So even him as a current C group CEO of the company, he can be taken out or removed from the position if he doesn't be able to qualify or acquire the K the target KPIs that he is required to achieve. So another one uh brand. I'm not sure if you're familiar if you're familiar with this. So Patek Philippe is a one of the oldest independent family owned Genevan watch manufacturer. So for them its independence enables it to control its own destiny while pursuing a long-term vision. So Patek Philippe was established for almost 185 years or back in 19, 1839. So they're providing watches for many uh, generations and they are still owned by a single family. So this is their tagline in their business. So imagine the way they do things, the quality that they provide, and the tagline is, you never actually own a Patek Philippe. You're merely looking after it for the next. So this tagline is very compelling because like, if you have watches, normally you will. it is a, an investment that you will be able to give for inheritance for your family so so back in 1997 they were able to come up this tagline as it also reflects who they are in the family as a family business so they really think of themselves as they taking they're just taking care of the family business as they transition so they transcended it to their product and the, the and when they sell their watches so as one of the oldest companies in the Philippines, which is the Ayalas, so they're like a Spanish Peninsulares from Spain. They settled in the Philippines and they're one of the largest uh, real estate developers in the country. So for them, ownership is a right of possession. Stewardship is a fiduciary role. So for them, it is holding the institution, which is their family business, in trust for the next generation. We feel as a family 
that this institution has been passed on to us for our care and not for us to dissipate or do what we'll, we will with it for our personal gain. So, this guy is Jaime Augusto Sobel de Ayala is, runs, he's the 8th generation of a 187-year-old company in the Philippines. So now, actually in this this year, they just recently announced that they're starting to let go of their position in the board as eventually young Ayala family clans are taking over or taking the mantle of the leadership of the Ayala group. So we also have here, we also have in Indonesia, one of the best uh, management principle. So I'm pretty sure you're familiar with Anthony Salim. So for him, this is his management principle. So first is learning by doing and by being involved. Don't be afraid to hire professionals. Have an open mind and heart. Try to create an environment based on your needs and principle. And you have to force to learn new materials and make contacts. So imagine even uh, as the Salim group, Mr. Anthony has this mindset. He's very innovative in on this management principle. So that's why he was able to come up with his lessons. So for him, there's no turning around. So the family business is like a train. It's like a moving train for him. That if you want to join, you have to jo jump into the train. So there's no delay. There's no turning back. Because your goal is really to prepare for the next generation and all of the things that you're doing is in order for you to be to sustain that growth and transfer the succession on a very smooth way. So whatever you're doing in the past for him is you have to move forward and be more innovative. The second lesson is we must keep business and personal matters separate. So I guess all of you are for those family businesses will try now to emulate him because in his in his le the lesson that he wants to share is personal and business matters should always not be at the same time when you're doing a board of direct directors meeting so as you as you do as you do that always it always incur conflicts so lesson number 3 we are more opportunity driven. We don't want to dwell on what we have. So uh, being one of the largest corporation, not just in the Philippines, I love that, not just in Indonesia, but as well as in Southeast Asia, they are driven by opportunity that uh, that falls to them. Now, the question is, will that opportunity works within their organization or can it, can the organization support it? So because they implement governance, they can support whatever drift opportunities they want to pursue. And number four, pick the right horses to run for you. Once you pick them, trust them. If you don't trust them, don't pick them at all. <laughs> that it is, this is true. So if you hire professional, pick the right horse. Don't um don't uh don't do it very don't do it fast. Don't do it because of whim. Don't do this because of um, nepotism. But always think if this this horse is really you can trust and give them the freedom to do their things. Of course, with limitations based on the rules that you will be, the organization is being set. So, because if you don't trust them running the show, then there's no point. So later I'll share to you that there is a one horse in the Philippines that he chose and he became successful in his expansion in the Philippines. So because for him, trust is good but control is better. Now, um, I want you to, to give comments on this uh, life les lesson by Anthony. Trust is good, but control is better. So in the lesson four, if you don't trust them, don't pick them. So you you have to trust them. But in lesson five, it mentioned that trust is good, but control is better. Why is that? Can you give me your comments or 
your thoughts on this? Oke, okay, silakan Bapak Ibu for lesson 5 ya, Prof. Only for lesson 5. Mm -hmm. The comment. Yes. Oke, okay. in the lesson 5 di lesson 5 ini trust is good but control is better. Oke, okay, kira-kira menurut Bapak Ibu bagaimana? Mm -hmm. Silakan menuliskan idenya di kolom chat. And why are you waiting sambil nunggu, Prof? Uh, I will write, uh, what is it? A summary. Okay. Uh, here I have Mr. Kelvin Lian yang writing his summary. The first, maybe you will may give the comment for this. Yeah. Okay, the first. The hair or the next generation need willingness and awareness to do the business. Without willingness and awareness, it's just a waste. Mm -hmm. And then the second, after having them, train the hair to have the professional business skill. What do you think? Is the summary uh, correct uh, in line with your explanation or how? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the hair need willingness and awareness to do business without willingness and awareness is just where and having them train. Um, yeah, it's it's yes, it's uh, it's it's right. Uh, but also the, the founding generation needs also to be educated. Okay, so it's always not just one generation who needs to be uh, the sole responsible of embracing the governance in the family business, it will always be a a uh, multi generational effort okay so like for instance if you're the founding generation you need to have a proper mindset or a open minded in terms of the changes that would happen because it will happen whether you like it or not the the next generation will eventually take over now the question is are you prepared or are you willing to take that or get that process of change within yourself and as well as to the family business. Because if there's no changes within the early generation or you won't be able to connect with the next generation, it will cause turmoil when you eventually transfer the power to the next generation because they will think that they will just avoid doing things that you're doing. There's times that they will always, okay, we're just gonna um, stop this business because we don't like the way my father or my mother works, the family, how they manage their family business. So instead of those kind of um, uh, hard feelings for the for both generation, it should be a work hand in hand within the generation because not all of the things that you knew probably understand by the fam the the, gener the the young generation now the, the the young generation is also needs to understand that there is a certain uh knowledge and wisdom that the older generation can impart to them both especially the values and vision since Many of the things in the next generation that are like innovative in terms of uh of doing business may not be under cannot understand by the or they can no longer can no longer understand by the the older generation. But the wisdom and experience that those older generations were able to accumulate is very vital for the next generation to understand and and at least get insights from them because. Their experience is key to the success of their family business. And, and if the young generation can listen to them and ready to initiate or be part of the process of, of uh, being trained or fully understood the family business, then it would allow to a more successful succession plan in the family business. So yes, yes, you're you're right in your in your summary of the su the seminar summary, and but you can add that to your notes as well. Okay. So, actually, I'll try to answer this very fast, uh, due to the limitation of time. 
So yes. Um, I'll finish my slides. It's a few more slides left. So in the Philippines, we the Salim group has a large uh, presence already. So they're into the media, power, water, infrastructure, and hospital. So Salim is one of the brill one of the brilliant uh, family businesses that were able to expand beyond their borders, beyond Indonesia. So they're very big, even here in the Philippines. We he was able to get the right horse here. The name is uh Mr. Mani Pangilinan. He is the go-to guy when they expanded in the Philippines. He is a professional that they gave uh, the, the reins to expand in the Philippine market. So, there. So, yes, uh, if you have any uh, questions, you can uh, message me in WhatsApp. Here's my QR. So, I'll open up my uh, open up the, this discussion uh, now. So, if you have any questions, please, please feel free to uh, message and tell me. Okay. okay. Yes. Thank you, Prof. Dennis. But wait, uh, let me read for lesson five first. Tadi ada, uh, we have some comments about lesson five. I think you haven't. Uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. It. Yes. The first from, uh, before going to the question, yeah. Uh, from uh, Mr. Sukianto here, because control way to reach the goal. And then second is from Ms. Stephanie. Trust requires us to give up some control. When we put too much trust to others, we tend to be dependent to others as well. Mm -hmm. And then here we have a comment from oh, Brisa. Trust can be broken by both parties, but if you have control, decision is in your hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then uh, the last one. Just like what uh, Kevin Tan said earlier in managing uh, Alliance Global Evaluation and Controlling is essential. Mm -hmm. Okay. W what do you think about that? Is mm -hmm. that okay? Oh, yes, yes, definitely. Um, As mentioned, if you give them the right um, uh, the freedom to make decisions, this would allow them to be more creative or to put in their effort or their their knowledge and talent to the family business but control is vital so i'll give you an exact experience, exact uh, situation so like for instance if you hire someone like a professional ceo so of course being the ceo technically is in control of the the business decisions then in order for you to control the control of the of the ceo of decision makings normally the business mem uh, family business members will tend to uh prevent them from doing financial decision am i right <laughs> so that's why some of the professional ceos will tend to uh be disappointed that even though they want to create or change some of the business operation implement new new policies or implement new innovative ways on doing business if you control their their financials then that's the time that they will that if you continuously doing that you will eventually uh lose the faith of those professionals to you and then eventually they will leave the company so how do we address that your your control you need to create a subset on each control on your control of, of any decision making of your professionals or even your family members who are working in your family business professionally. So one is create a certain provision or create a certain level of uh, actual amount. So like for instance, for any, let's say 100,000 US dollars uh, decision making, 100,000 below, the CEO can decide, period. So in that way, he or she will feel that he's being trusted with that kind of amount of uh, of uh, money to do business transaction. Then if you go 100,001 above, it would be, it will require a board decision. So that's, a con that's one example of control. So meaning you're 
managing the financial side, but you also give them the freedom to decide on the financial aspect as well. So anything beyond the 100,000 mark, it would be approved by the board, by the family members. So again, the term is approved. So if it approves, then the CEO can still implement the trust, the 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 business deal or whatever transaction he wants to pursue. But there will be controls in terms of limitation on how they will release the funds or how it would be managed effectively. So normally the fam some of the family successful family members they will they will limit their control in terms of in the corporate level as well as on the financial and audit level but on the operations they are not uh they are not uh like intervene they do not intervene with those uh in the operational level so yeah as mentioned by Risa, trust can be broken by both parties. But if you have control, decision is in your hand. Yes, I totally agree with this. So, again, actually the trust should also be written. <laughs> there should be a clarity on what level of trust can you provide? What can level of trust can you give to your professionals or even to your family members? So, that's why it's vital for the family constitution to be written on such details that allows each family members the clarity on their scope and limitation. So that's why there is a certain term that we call the four R's and one A. So in a family constitution, there should be four R's, which is the rules, roles, rights, responsibility, and the 1A, which is accountability. So if in your family business, you will be able to write those four R's and 1A, pretty much you will be able to get at least a, some sort of level of trust and control within your family business. So that would also transcend to the family, as a, to the non-family members. Okay. Okay, because of the limit, uh, limitation, the time limit, uh, I will go to the last question, Prof. Here still, uh, is there any research related to non-profit business runs by family? Yeah, maybe the, uh, what is it? Pa Imam Makrub here wants to know, is there any research about it? Yeah, um, uh, since in Indonesia, there are many educational institutions runs uh, run by families so he wants to know about any research uh, related to non-profit business mm, okay okay um well in indonesia i have i don't have the date the, the the data for the non-profit businesses run by families but here in the philippines normally the non-profit side is uh being run by most uh, conglomerates here in the fam in the Philippines. Although there are some small-scale family businesses like the medium size and the large-scale enterprises here that have a uh, non-profit because they normally create, when they reach a certain level of their family business, they create foundations so mm. that the foundations can be a non-profit in, 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 in its uh, nature. But owned by a family enterprise. Mm -hmm. So many of the educational institution, although we have a different uh, setup here because majority of the of the the educational institutions here are being run by religious groups. So mm -hmm. like the Catholic Church, we have a lot of uh, Lot, well, a lot of uh, educational institutions here that are being run by the Catholic Church. Mm. Although we all the remaining 50%, maybe around 50% are in the religious uh, run, and the remaining 50 or maybe uh sorry, 70, 30, 70% are privately run. So they're small scale educations. So in terms of how they govern it, it really still the same. It's some of them are being run by like a like again like a mom and pop institution, but as they grow their business, 
they are there is a so certain for uh inflection point that they will be required to at least implement a form of uh governance with it because again many many of course their customer is the students so that's why regulators here in the Philippines we is very um they are very uh strict on the accreditation of different education institutions so that's why um of course there are times that they need to be re there are a lot of times that they need to be regulated so that to keep the education system uh in terms of quality being in check so yeah so but i think there is there is a research there but maybe we can uh, we can further discuss it in the future okay thank you jadi uh, dari prof sendiri pasti ada riset tentang itu tapi memang kenyataannya tidak hanya di Indonesia tapi juga di Filipin uh, apa namanya uh, bisnis keluarga ini family bisnis ini running sekolah seperti itu ya oke okay. thank you Prof uh, I think we are at the end of our uh, open lecture agenda for tonight and uh, What is it for the last session before I close? I would like to have a photo session. Inilah uh, persembahan dari Magister Management Program Pasca Sarjana Institut Teknologi dan Bisnis Asia Malang. Selalu menghadirkan ilmu-ilmu yang luar biasa yang kami suguhkan secara gratis kepada baik. Bapak Ibu eh, mahasiswa yang telah bergabung ataupun eh, semuanya yang tertarik untuk bergabung dengan kita di eh, Prodi Magister Management. Saat ini kami membuka pendaftaran untuk batch 15 dengan konsentrasi bisnis, pendidikan publik dan pariwisata perhotelan. Silahkan Bapak Ibu yang eh, apa namanya berminat bisa menghubungi admin kami di nomor 081-235-267-130. Nah, seperti yang Bapak Ibu lihat di belakang saya ada tulisan lulus MM satu setengah tahun. Benar Bapak Ibu, kurikulum kami memang dibuat untuk eh, selesai dalam waktu setengah satu setengah tahun karena atau tiga semester karena kami punya slogan lulus cepat servis mantap dan ilmu dahsyat oke okay. terima kasih untuk kehadiran semuanya thank you prof uh, hopefully we can see you in the next occasion kami sangat berharap sekali gitu ya we can uh, meet for, uh, in the next occasion occasion uh, uh, have a nice uh, day for today and thank you for all the audiences terima kasih untuk semua yang sudah hadir saya akhiri mohon maaf untuk segala kekurangannya uh, terima kasih kehadiran Bu Risa mungkin ada sepatah dua patah kata aman, aman, dari Bu Risa oke okay. teman-teman sudah strong sampai jam segini tadi masih 110 sebelum foto ya yeah. bermanfaat Pastinya, pastinya bermanfaat sekali Bu Risa. Terima kasih ini karena uh, bantuan dari Bu Risa juga Bapak Ibu. Kita bisa menghadirkan Prof. Dennis di sini. Oke, okay. terima kasih semuanya. Kami akhiri sampai ketemu di lain waktu dengan ilmu yang tidak kalah dahsyatnya. Selamat malam. Uh, saya akhiri. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.